the Fed clearly needs to start hiking rates um, and uh, probably not shock therapy, uh, definitely not shock therapy. Higher prices um, causing inflation. It's not in the interest of consumers, but not in the interest of producers either. I feel that our job is to make sure that the energy is there as best as possible, as much of it as possible. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacquay here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Diplomatic frenzy. Olaf Scholz heads to Kiev today and Moscow tomorrow. The U.S. warns an invasion may be imminent. The geopolitical risks over Ukraine ripple through global markets. European stocks fall in early trading. And a Hollywood ending for the Rams while well, the Los Angeles-based team win the Super Bowl after scoring a late touchdown. Now, first thing is first, we'll get into the Super Bowl a little bit later from a business angle. We'll talk you through the numbers, but the markets, look at the markets. I mean, we've never really seen anything like it in the last couple of months. The European stock 600 down some 2.8 percent. There was intelligence over the weekend from the U.S. that there could be an imminent invasion of Ukraine by Russia, something that Russia has denied. But this is repricing a lot of the markets, tensions over the military buildup. Now, warning, of course, of an invasion being imminent means that we also need to look at the psychological effect that it does to inflation. So we have palladium up. 40 percent of the world's palladium comes from Russia. We have wheat prices up and, of course, energy gas prices at a time where already it's extremely tricky for central banks to decide what to do with inflation. One of the biggest, uh, well, the industry groups that's losing the most is travel and leisure, down some 4 percent. And then we're seeing haven bids across the board, a bid for a lot of these bonds. The German uh, five-year yield at minus 0.01. NYMEX crewed at 92.98. Now, again, the uncertainty really that we have over the price of oil as we edge up over towards 100 is another blow to markets that are really already pretty skittish when it comes to inflation and also the prospect of aggressive Federal Reserve hike. Now, the difference between, for example, a CAC 40 that's down some 3.5% and a DAX that's, I think, down some 3% in the UK is the fact that actually the UK um, and the FTSE 100 is down by less because it still has support from companies like BP. So as the price of oil goes higher for these, it lifts, of course, the FTSE 100 as a go. But you can see a sea of red. Again, everyone on tenterhooks with this shuttle diplomacy with Olaf Scholz going to Kiev today and then to Russia tomorrow. So more on this Ukraine crisis. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, says Russia can invade Ukraine at any time, despite continuing some of these diplomatic efforts. Now, Moscow has repeatedly denied any plans to do so. The way they have built up their forces, the way they have maneuvered things in place makes it a distinct possibility that there will be major military action very soon. Let's bring in Bloomberg's European correspondent Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, a week of a weekend rather of hectic diplomacy, little to show for it. What's next? Yes, Francine, and what a 48 hours we had. And a lot of this, just to remind everyone, as you said, it really kicks off on Friday. There is a PBS report suggesting that this attack is imminent. They put a date on it. They say it's Tuesday, so tomorrow, and that it would target the Ukrainian capital. Now, when you look at what the White House is seeing, they're not confirming any dates, but they still say this attack is imminent. Of course, this sent everyone on a spiral. We've heard uh, from Emmanuel Macron over the weekend. That is a fourth call between the two saying that Honest and sincere dialogue means there can be no escalation. And another warning about swift and very severe sanctions on the Russian economy if there were to be an invasion. Now, what is interesting here, Francine, of course, is that the Russians keep saying this is Western hysteria. They are trying to create a panic in Eastern Europe and then blame it on Russia. The other thing, of course, that we're looking very much on is that trip from Olaf Scholz going to Ukraine today and tomorrow meeting Vladimir Putin. For the first time, there will be a face-to-face meeting between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the concern is that there's more and more troops. It has gone from 100,000 to 130,000 uh, troops. So the next stop is, you know, Olaf Scholz in Ukraine today and Tuesday. What are we expecting from that? Any possible breakthrough? 
Yeah, and, and well, you know, Francine, on the troops, what the Russians say is that this is being happening or is happening in their territory and that they do not confirm the numbers that the Western allies are putting forward. But we also heard from NATO that they have seen or they believe there has been an incremental uh, jump in the past two weeks. Now, in terms of this breakthrough, well, well, you know, this will be a huge test for Olaf Scholz, who is slipping in polls. He has been accused of being soft on Russia. The SPD as a party has been accused to, of meddling too much with Russian authorities and Tomorrow will be a first platform for him to say very clearly put an end to the ambiguity around Nord Stream 2. Whether he does it or not will really remains to be seen. Maria, thank you so much. Right, Maria, today we're there with the very latest, of course, on the situation in Ukraine. Now we're joined by Mike Bell, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Mike, great to have you on a day also where the market are really concerned about what's happening with geopolitics. We can't read Vladimir Putin's head. So as a portfolio manager, how do you play this? Well, I think clearly it's a significant risk and it's one where the uncertainty is elevated, not just on whether there'll actually be an invasion, but what the Western response to that would be and then the impact on energy prices. But with energy prices already so high and that squeezing real wages, further shocks I think do pose a risk. So I think to me it makes sense to be dialing back one's risk positions a bit. Not overreacting, but just moderating the size of risk positions and getting a bit closer to neutral than one would otherwise be. Mike, what, what happens if there's, not, if there's not an invasion, but actually, you know, consumers almost like go into a frenzy of thinking that there's inflation, which will feed to auto... I don't know if it's automatic, but will feed to higher inflation. Like, how do you protect yourself against that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are different risks, because if you have the real wage squeeze, that's going to weigh on people's ability to spend on other non-energy goods. Uh, and then eventually that would moderate the inflation pressure and have different implications. Whereas if it starts to feed through into a wage price spiral, which is what everyone's really concerned about, that's obviously the worst case scenario where you get um, high inflation and you've got this hit from energy prices. Uh, that's really quite difficult to hedge other than with something like put options or derivatives to try and hedge some of that risk out. Um, because I think it would weigh on some of the higher valued stocks at the mm -hmm. same time as, uh, you know, weighing on risk assets more broadly. So I think, you know, lo looking out there at the moment, probably just makes sense to dial that risk back a little bit and have less of an overweight than one would, would have had if this was not the case. Um, Mike, give me a sense of the, how you play this. How do you, you know, what happens, for example, to bond yields in this environment? What do you buy into? Yeah, it's very hard to say, frankly. I, I mean, with, with, with bond yields, uh, obviously, higher inflation, all else equal, you would think if you get that wage price spiral, then it leads to central banks putting rates up further. But I do think the risk for those higher oil prices is that it's going to weigh on growth uh, because it's essentially a tax on the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so, if anything, when I look at the pricing that's currently baked in for this year for bond prices, it seems to me like it's more likely that rates go up a little bit slower than is currently being priced. Mm -hmm. um, I think eventually rates are going to rise further than is being priced unless, um, you know, unless this ends up causing a significant hit to growth. Mike, there's something that I really caught my eye, and actually, I don't know how you model this, and it's extremely difficult. So I know it's like, you know, for you, it's probably a nightmare day to call on Bloomberg TV to try and explain how you look at this. But uh, Bloomberg Economics has something called a shock model, CHOK, and basically they say that a climb in crude to $100 a barrel from, you know, $70 at the end of 2021 translates into inflation going higher by about half a percentage point in the U.S. and Europe in the second half of the year. I mean, that's huge for central banks. Yeah, I, I, I guess it comes down to how persistent it is, which is, you know, what we've been talking about for over a year now. But it comes down to me to the fact that you can't avoid this, right? Obviously, in the long run, it'd be great for people to be able to switch away from fossil fuels. But at the moment, people don't have that option in a very sort of quick way. And therefore, it is going to reduce the amount that people have to spend on other things. Now, particularly in the US, they've still got pretty elevated savings. Our data suggests that household deposits are still about 80% higher than they were pre-pandemic. So it's probably not going to cause a recession, but it does mean that they've got less money to spend on fun stuff uh, than they otherwise would do. And so that could actually end up dampening core inflation, even though it obviously puts higher near-term pressure on headline inflation. 
Um, so, but it is very hard to read. It's very hard to yeah. read. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, Mike Bell there, of course, from JP Morgan Asset Management, stays with us and we'll have plenty more on how you read inflation. Also, G7 ministers saying that they are ready to act swiftly to support Ukraine. That, I imagine, is through sanctions. But it could also, if you stop Nord Stream 2, put extra pressure on gas prices and therefore on inflation. The G7 putting out a communique saying that the Russian buildup by the borders is cause for grave concern. A reminder, Russia has denied that they're looking at invading Ukraine. Finance ministers are commenting in this joint email statement, but they have agreed that the sanctions would have massive and immediate impact. So it's a different tone to what we saw a couple of weeks ago where we saw really allies fracturing. It seems that Vladimir Putin has now managed to consolidate at least the G7 finance minister to speaking with one voice. Coming up, we'll discuss what the Fed and ECB need to do to bring inflation under control. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's take a look at some of the events we're following throughout the week. Today, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz travels to Ukraine for talks with President Zelensky. Now, BHP and Glencore kick off the latest round of earnings from top miners when they report on Tuesday, then it's UK CPI on Wednesday, with economists forecasting annual inflation hitting 5.5%. Then on Thursday, it's Turkey's rate decision. Consensus forecasts point to the central bank keeping interest rates unchanged. And finally, on Friday, it's French CPI for January. Now, how far and how fast should the Fed go on its fight to keep U.S. inflation under control? Bloomberg TV guests weigh in on the debate. I think we're now in a situation where the Fed clearly needs to start hiking rates. If you move aggressively now, you have a chance of regaining policy credibility. If they act too aggressively or if they don't act enough, there's going to be some challenges to growth, potential for slowdown. If they do hike by seven, which is becoming the consensus call, they may break something in the economy. This is clearly a very hot economy, and uh, it's the Fed's job to cool it off a bit. The Fed should have a special meeting right now to end QE. I wouldn't stop QE suddenly. They should have done that much early. If they do it now, the market will sense blood they will sense that the Fed is panicking. You can see the pressure that's building on the Fed. You can see the narrative. So it's really sort of a rock and a hard place right now. Well, let's now get more with our guest, Mike Bell, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Mike, I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about, the fact that actually it's extremely difficult, especially on the back of this possible invasion of Ukraine, with the U.S. intelligence warning of that to actually predict the markets or predict inflation. Let me bring you over to a chart that's a classic growth versus value chart, which I don't know even if it makes sense anymore because of this geopolitical risk. But let's bring you that and, and see how you would play it. Do you go into, you know, value stocks at the moment just because of where we are in the cycle, Mike? Well, I mean, I think energy stocks obviously benefit in a world where oil prices go higher, yeah. gas prices go higher. Um, on, on the other hand, if it's going to hurt growth, then eventually that can become self-defeating, both for the oil price but also for things like banks mm. and some of those cyclical value stocks. So I think if we didn't have this Ukraine risk and what that could no. do to growth then it would be, a, I think, a relatively clear-cut view that the Fed are going to still put rates up further than the market's pricing and that that tends to lead to value outperformance. But I do think the Ukraine situation complicates the trade in the short term. But, I mean, it certainly does complicate it. Is there an assumption that the central banks could look at a policy mistake or could you just need to trust the process? I mean, for me, I think that if they start doing 50 basis point hikes, it starts to become a bit risky because the market then is going to find it very difficult to know what's coming in the future. So if it were me, I would look to deliver 25 basis point hikes, maybe four or five this year, see what happens to growth as a result of the higher energy prices and whether mm -hmm. that weighs on growth in a way, um, and take it from there. You know, they can always speed up if they need to. Yeah. But I think if they do 50 basis points, then that does risk the markets panicking that, yeah. you know, are they going to do 50 basis points every quarter? You can right. get to a level that starts to become worrying a bit 
more quickly than is desirable. Yeah, and the, I mean, I don't know whether it's group think in the markets, but there is definitely a concern that even ECB bets spike before the ECB even talks because inflation is higher in the U.S. Let's uh, bring you over to the other chart, which I love. So thank you, Dan Curtis, for putting these together for us. And it's basically looking at this tighter world. You can see the ECB, uh, the blue line right underneath your screen compared to the Bank of England in yellow and the Federal Reserve in white. And I don't know whether you play how you play that differential, whether it's through currencies or something else. I mean, for me, I guess what you're seeing is that you're not really seeing the wage growth in Europe yet. Yep. So in the US and the UK, you're really seeing the wage growth come through. There's a risk that with higher energy prices that that turns into a more sort of self-fulfilling cycle. Um, but in Europe, you're not seeing that yet. Now, you are mm -hmm. seeing some minimum wage increases, so it's possible that it could start to feed through into more broad-based wage mm -hmm. growth in Europe, in which case, you know, maybe that trade has further to go. But at the moment, it seems to me a little bit premature to be saying that the ECB are going to be on this sustained rate hiking mm -hmm. cycle. It may well be that they want to take this opportunity of high inflation to get out of negative rates, because I think that was mm -hmm. a policy mistake to go into negative rates in the first place. But once they get to zero, I think you're really going to need to see that wage yeah. growth coming through for them to want to be having a sustained hiking cycle in the way that you're going to see from the Fed and the BOE. Mike, thank you so much. Mike Bell, the global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management, joining us on a pretty tricky markets day. Now, it is Valentine's Day. Up next, we talk about the dating app is safe enough to take the risk. We'll be joined by the chief executive of Flutter, the first dating app to require full biometric ID verification. It launches today. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the market really falling out of bed. We have a lot of pressure because of the possible invasion of Ukraine. Certainly, that's after a U.S. intelligence report stating so. And we're seeing oil significantly higher, although now stabilizing a touch. And you can see European stocks down some 2.5% to NYMEX 93.22. Now, Flutter, the UK's first dating app to receive or require full biometric ID verification, launches today. With the aim of protecting users from fake profiles, catfishing and romance fraud, Flutter uses AI to create a safer dating experience. Well, we're delighted to be joined on Valentine's Day by Flutter's chief executive and co-founder, Rhonda Alexander. Rhonda, what a wonderful idea. And I imagine what the uptake is. Are you expecting a lot of people to want this just to make sure that, you know, a lot of the users are safe? Well, as you well know, every day we see another report of some bad behavior, romance, fraud, scams that are affecting people all around the world. And it seems that the time is absolutely right for this kind of approach, which keeps people safe online. Do you see much more of an awareness, actually, of some of the fraud that you're talking about? There, there was, you know, the hits uh, movie that we're also seeing on Netflix. D d has that changed the way that people have been using some of the dating apps? I think so. It's definitely highlighted the abuse that's going on in the industry. I mean, it's a vibrant, thriving, growing industry, which is slated to reach almost $11 billion in the next few years. So it's very much the norm for people to be looking online to find their connections. And uh, the news that we're seeing and, and the reports that are coming out more and more of people revealing some of the traumas that they've encountered, and especially with that Netflix documentary of uh, The Tinder Swindler, it really highlights that there's a need for change. Um, Rhonda, what's the uptake been like? So I imagine a lot of females, because they feel safer, safer, want to go on Flutter. Have you seen resistance from men? Uh, actually not. It's very much across the board. While women tend to report and reveal some of the activity that's been harmful, uh, men are also suffering, and they are definitely the more likely targets of catfishing, for example, and uh, terrible mm -hmm. fraud that takes place in that way. So Flutter is for men and women across the board for all uh, identities. And we're creating an ecosystem which is safe and empowered by 
biometric identity verification. You cannot enter Flutter unless you've gone through full biometric ID. And we're the first dating app that's requiring that. And we're mm -hmm. also very much in line with the thinking regulatory uh, wise of the online harm bill that's been introduced in the UK and how the, the regulatory environment is coming up uh, with suggestions as to how to combat this terrible abuse. Yeah. Um, Rhonda, biometric ID technology, does it require to actually, is it a passport or is it, you know, something else? Our partner is a worldwide leader in digital identity called Yoti. Okay. And Yoti requires you to either give your passport or your driving license or a government uh, certified identity verification um, uh, uh, item that enables you to set up your Yoti ID. And once you verify, you only have to do it once. And your data is only accessed by you and Flutter does not store or sell mm -hmm. any of our personal data for our, for our Flutterers. Uh, Rhonda, thank you so much. Rhonda Alexander there. Thank you so much for joining us today on Valentine's Day. Rhonda Alexander, Chief Executive and co-founder of Flutter, this new dating app launching in the UK. Now coming up, as the UK mulls sanctions on Russian billionaire property owners, we'll discuss the outlook for prime central London real estate. That's coming up shortly. We'll have a full roundup also of your stocks to watch. The focus, of course, on Ukraine. Uh, Olaf Scholz traveling to Kiev ahead of the Putin visit tomorrow. He goes to Kiev today and then goes to Russia. Stocks falling, geopolitical risks over Ukraine rippling through global markets, all fluctuating after some of the earlier gains. U.S. and European bond yields declining, the dollar ticking up. This is Bloomberg. Diplomatic frenzy, Olaf Scholz heads to Kiev today and Moscow tomorrow. The U.S. warns an invasion may be imminent. The geopolitical risks over Ukraine ripple through global markets. European stocks fall in early trading. And a Hollywood ending for the Rams. Will the Los Angeles-based team win the Super Bowl after scoring a late touchdown? Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's check in on the markets because there's a lot of movement after that warning from U.S. intelligence about a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine. Stocks falling, geopolitical risks over Ukraine really rippling through global markets. Oil, we're looking at fluctuating after earlier gains, U.S. and European bond yields declining, the dollar ticking up. Now it's very clear that we had this U.S. warning, an invasion may be imminent. President Vladimir Putin accusing America, though, of failing to meet his demands. Russia has repeatedly denied it plans to invade its neighbor. Markets seem to just be covering their positions in case something ugly happens. But again, the uncertainty is dealing another blow to markets that are already pretty skittish about inflation and the prospect of aggressive Federal Reserve interest rate hikes to tame inflation. Now, let's start with the Ukraine crisis and President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, says Russia could invade Ukraine at any time despite continuing diplomatic efforts. Efforts, while Moscow has repeatedly denied any plans to do so. The way they have built up their forces, the way they have maneuvered things in place, makes it a distinct possibility that there will be major military action very soon. We'll stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition because in the next few minutes we'll discuss the geopolitical and markets risks with our very own Ukraine expert Mark Champion with Blue Bay's Timothy Ash. If you have any questions for them, IB Plus TV Go. Now, after years of underperforming prime central London house prices may see a recovery in 2022, the market with a heavy reliance on affluent international buyers missed out on the surging property prices seen in the rest of the UK in 2021. So could the reopening of the economy actually see prices rebound. Well, we're joined by Nicolò Baratieri. He's chief executive of the London-based luxury property developer Northacre. So, Nicolò, as always, thank you so much for joining us. You always usually make us, you know, a lot smarter on what we, what kind of properties people want to the price range, but also where the buyers are coming from. What's happening to Russian buyers that historically were always interested in prime London real estate? Yeah, as you say, you know, historically, the Russians have been very present in the super prime space. But if you look at when they were the most active, it was during the previous wave, which went from, let's say, 2009 to the peak of 2014. 
since then they have been a very small proportion of the market which has been you know which is overtaken by asian buyers and and ultimately in the last couple of years by local owner occupiers um, where their home is a much greater focus than it was before as a pandemic fueled desire to have a better home so who's still coming into the london prime real estate market and buying Look, I think international buyers have been quiet for the last two and a half years. Uh, previous to that, Asian buyers were a, a, a large proportion of, of buyers of super prime. Um, but lately, in the last, I would say, year, year and a half, it's been, it's been local buyers that, that want a better home than they have before. And if you look at the numbers of what's happened, you know, 2021 had 522 uh, prime home sales. Those are classified as 5 million plus um, homes. Uh, that's just shy of what happened in 2013 at 533. So the market has been very strong. It's been up about 10.5% in 2021. And if you look at actually just yeah. Q4, Q4 alone had 163 prime home sales, which is uh, an increase of about 40% in the previous quarter, and the biggest total spend ever recorded, right, which, has, which was fueled by 20 million plus home sales. Nicola, are you expecting international mar you know, buyers to actually come into this market? And why have they been staying away? Is it because of some of the sanctions? Is it because of geopolitical uncertainty? Or is it simply Brexit? I think there are, there are um, a number of reasons. I think that uh, Brexit was one of them. Look, we have to remember that since the peak in 2014, we've had Brexit. We had three prime ministers. We had two changes in stamp duty, non-done changes, uh, and a pandemic at the end. So quite a bit has been thrown to this market. Um, but at the end, the owner-occupiers have, have really taken the lead in the last two years and have been strong. If we then couple that with potential reopening of travel in 2022, we expect a strong market. And let's say that if yeah. it's as strong as just 2021, we're, we're happy. Are, are local buyers more price sensitive, even at these very high-end properties, to international buyers? It, historically, that's very much the case. They have always been more price sensitive. But I think what is happening now is that the focus has changed from the postcode to the product. And, and they are very discerning. They want the best product possible. And at the end, they're, ultimately, they're willing to pay for it. So their price sensitivity is, is decreasing. So how are you expecting prices in luxury central London locations to develop over the next year? I think that it's, there, there are a couple of things. I think there's strong demand on one side, but there's very limited supply. So if you look, the imbalance is, is greater than it has been for the last seven or eight years. And hence, we feel that that will support the market like it has in 2021. It's quite incredible to think that we've done numbers that are similar to the peak in 2013 and 2021. No one would say that that's the case. But those are, those are just the statistics. Uh, Nicola, I mean, there's also scarcity of timber, of workers. There's a shortage almost at left, right and center of every raw material. Does it mean that you will be building less apartments going forward? Look, I think that development in central London going forward is going to be very challenged, right? It's challenged for several reasons. On the planning side, there are a lot of new restrictions that have come in with the new London plan that came into effect in 2019. As an example, in Westminster, you will not be able to build any more apartments that are over 200 square meters or 2,000 square feet. So that's one restriction. And then at the end, costs have gone uh, through the roof. There's been hyperinflation in construction. But also on the lending side, um, it's, it's become much more expensive. So I see that in a certain way, you know, these, um, this vintage of developments, let's say finished between two years ago and the next two years, are literally the last hurrah of high-end residential for some time. Nicolò, thank you so much. As always, Nicolò Barattieri, there, the Chief Executive Officer of Northacre, talking to us about the high-end luxury market of London real estate. Now, in the meantime, we're just getting a Bloomberg News, I think it's a Bloomberg scoop, HSBC, to double some of the junior banker bonuses in the race for talent. Now, the lender, which pays less than most rivals a year ago, or they were one of the ones that paid the less a year ago after cutting the bonus pool at its global banking markets division by 15%, we understand now wants to avoid losing junior staff to Wall Street firms who have been consistently raising pay. Now, this is according to people familiar with the matter that have been speaking to our Harry, Denise and Aberdeen. And uh, more senior employees are also said to be in line for 2021 bonus hikes of at least 10 percent. So I don't know whether this is inflationary overall or this is just playing catch up with some of the Wall Street banks. Coming up, tense diplomacy. President Biden promises a swift response if Russia invades Ukraine. Crude rallies pushing towards $100 a barrel. That story's up next, and this is Bloomberg.
I think time is of the essence for a company like ours to make its transformation. Um, we've been an international oil company for 112 years. We want to transform ourselves into an integrated energy company. Uh, it's what society wants and needs. It's what our staff and employees want and need. And ultimately, uh, we will prove that it's what our shareholders need. So we need it to crack on, we need it to press on. Um, there is an emergency happening around us and uh, in many ways we can't wait. Um, and that's why we decided to do it. And I feel it was the right decision. I mean, what do you say to the cynics that say, look, it, it's all nice and fine, but a lot of it is greenwashing and you're not a good company, you're just a less toxic company than some of the other oil majors? Well, um, the first thing to say is that you know, I'm a big believer in we need to put ourselves in other person's shoes in life in general. And so I understand that point of view and I get that people have that perspective. I don't agree with that, obviously, but I understand where they're coming from. We have an enormous challenge as society, which is to provide the world with reliable, affordable and clean energy. That's what society wants, that's what society needs. And I believe in my heart that a company like BP is actually one of the few companies in the world who can actually make that happen. We can talk about the things that we're going to grow and over the coming years and I find it hugely exciting and energizing for our organization. But that's what the world needs and you simply can't go against the grain of society. You can't defy gravity. And that's why we're making the change that we're making. Well, that was the VP Chief Executive Bernard Ludi, and you can catch that full conversation on Leaders with LACWA that's airing later this month on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg.com. Now, let's get back to the latest on the Ukraine tensions. Joining us now is Bloomberg Senior Reporter for International Affairs, Mark Champion, who's been covering international affairs for major media outlets for decades. He's just also returned from Ukraine. Also joining us, Blue Bay Asset Management's Timothy Ant, one of the foremost experts when it comes to Russia. So thank you both for joining us. First of all, Mark, what's, I, I mean, how as an investor, how as a geopolitical watcher, do we measure the, you know, what do we think Vladimir Putin will do? I mean, this feels like the most difficult question of the decade. I, I think that's probably about right. I mean, I, I, my, my basic sense about this is that, you know, for people who think that they know that he won't go in, um, they, they probably don't. And yep. that people are absolutely sure of how he will go in or when he will go in, they probably don't. And, you know, you can see that, um, that uh, you know, uncertainty roiling markets right now. Um, probably uh, they've been a little too calm until now. No. Um, but we're now at that point. Uh, the stuff, you know, the, the Russian uh, technical no. uh, troops, uh, the personnel, they're all in place. So it could happen any day or it could not happen. But we really don't still know. Um, Tim, do you think Vladimir Putin wants to invade or does he want to inflict chaos and uncertainty, which he's doing right now? Well, you know, it's difficult to predict whether or not he's, he's actually going to go in, as Mark said. But I think what we do know is the status quo does not work for Putin, right? I mean, he's gone through the mint process, the Normandy fees, et cetera. He hasn't got what he wanted. So, you know, this is all about changing the narrative, trying to um, um, shake things up a little bit and push things on. And, and so that's the risk. The status quo is not working. He needs to do something different. Does he need to escalate? Well, you know, we'll find out in the next few weeks, okay. I guess. Um, uh, Timothy, we also know that Russia says that they have a very strong economy to be able to deal with any kind of sanction or also, you know, this invasion of Ukraine. Is that true? Well, it is. I mean, you look, 630 billion reserves, FX reserves, uh, very little debt, less than 20 percent, uh, public sector debt. Uh, external debt also is not, not huge. But, you know, the kind of sanctions that the Americans are talking about, uh, and I do believe them this time because I think for... But this administration, I think it's important to remember, they weren't really interested in Russia and Ukraine, right? They wanted to focus on China. But this crisis has hit, and I think people like Jake Sullivan, et cetera, have realized that actually if, if they're going to stop China over Taiwan, they have to stop Putin over Ukraine. So that's why I think we're going to see very aggressive sanctions this time, and they will hurt Russia, undoubtedly. Um, you know, sanctions have had an impact. They've stalled growth. They've made Russia a very stagnant economy. Uh, great balance sheet, but no growth. 
Yeah. Mark, I mean, you know, something that struck me is Emmanuel Macron coming back to France and saying this is a different Vladimir Putin, a much harder Vladimir Putin, a more calculated, a less friendly uh, president of Russia. What does it mean for diplomacy? Olaf Scholz is going there tomorrow, today he's in Kiev. I mean, do, do we just put a stop to diplomacy altogether? Uh, well, you, you can't put a stop to diplomacy. I mean, this will be like a large, last-ditch effort. Um, there will be, you know, there may be more last-ditch efforts, depending on what Putin likes, uh, depends, uh, wants to do. Um, I think it's true, uh, you know, Putin's always been a tough character. I think Macron's got, you know, slightly rose-tinted glasses about the past when you're thinking about this. You think back to the Crimea, you think back to Georgia and so on. This is a tough president. Um, but he is um, really, uh, the war path is the wrong, you know, phrase to use right now, but, uh, but he is. He's on the warpath. As Tim said, he wants to change the story. And there is a, you know, the interesting thing to me is that when you speak to people who are, you know, closer to the Kremlin, um, they'll say that they, they don't know what he's going to do. But they will say that, you know, we've already had a success. Um, already in the West, people are talking about, do we really need NATO expansion, for example? Yep. NATO is a subject for discussion in the way that it wasn't before. The question yep. we don't know is, uh, what does Putin need in terms yep. of a level of success? And how long is his plan to get what he wants? Timothy, what do you think could deter, at this point, Vladimir Putin? There was a pretty tough editorial by um, an Apple Batman, The Atlantic, saying, like, look, we need to go hard, expel people, but also make sure that the kids that go to private school in Switzerland and the UK are thrown out. Maybe that will get Russia's attention. Well, I, I slightly disagree with Mark. I mean, I think th he hasn't achieved very much so far, because what he's achieved is, I think, NATO's more unified there's more direction of pur purpose than we've seen in, in a decade. And Ukraine has been rearmed. And I mean, I, I've always thought this is not really about NATO, it's about Ukraine. Putin wants to bring Ukraine back under Russia's geopolitical orbit. He was, he was, he's not happy about the fact that Ukraine is building a defensive capability. Uh, and the, the rearmament of Ukraine we've seen in the last couple of weeks just, just plays against Putin. So, so I'm not sure he's, he's really winning. Uh, and that's the problem. You know, he's not got very much from what he's done so far. Uh, he doesn't like the status quo, so you know what's he going to do next? Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I don't disagree. I mean, the, the point, the point there is that you know, as it, it's sometimes put, you know, we there are various things we want, but the first thing we need is the political. The political is these, you know, the 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 concession on NATO. Um, and but I would agree with Tim. This is ultimately about Ukraine. Yeah. Um, that is what Na you know NATO expansion is is mostly about. Mm -hmm. But it, and it isn't even just about NATO expansion. It's also about the EU expansion. This all began with a trade deal, after all, not NATO. Uh, so yeah. It's a big. It's a big agenda that Putin has. Um, uh, Tim, does I mean I know it's difficult, but is are we at 50/50? The chances that actually he invades Ukraine, also because he wants to spur that nationalism back home. Well, I, I've I've been pretty vocal in, in what I think, and uh, you know, uh, I think the the messaging from the U.S. administration that didn't want a conflict with Russia. Just again, go back to that. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of stuff out there saying that. This is warmongering by the Biden administration. They didn't want a crisis with Russia over Ukraine, right? They wanted to focus on China. They have no interest particularly, or they had no interest in providing all this really detailed intelligence about what the Russians may or may not be doing, right? But I think it's, it's stark, you know, what, what we're seeing on the ground. And on the balance of probability, you know, the, the risks are certainly, uh, in my mind, it's about, it, it, again, Putin's not getting wanted. Stacey doesn't like the status quo. He's more likely to escalate than de-escalate. Um, Timothy, very quickly. I mean, I, I know there's, of course, they have play. You know, they have palladium. They have wheat. How does that? If there is an invasion, as as an investment manager, like, you know, do you run for the hills or how do you play this? You know, it's, it's hard to be too clever in this scenario, right? I mean, just just read what our governments are telling us, right? And and that would suggest you need to be very very cautious about Russia and Ukraine risks. All right, thank you both for joining us. Bloomberg's Mark Champion and Blue Bay Asset Management's Timothy Ash. Now let's get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Francine. Clarion shares have plunged after it delayed publishing its results and started an investigation into its accounting. This comes after internal whistleblowers said it may have incorrectly booked provisions and accreals. The Swiss chemicals company says it may need to restate results for 2020 and for the first half of this year. Now sources tell us Apple is boosting pay for its U.S. retail workers as it navigates a tight labor market. Rises 
prices of between 2 to 10 percent have been offered to some salespeople and Genius Bar tech support staff. It comes after Apple revealed plans to offer part-time staff paid vacation for the very first time, as well as more sick days and childcare benefits. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, it was a closely fought win for the LA Rams in this year's Super Bowl, but the new stars off the field are cryptocurrency exchanges. What a halftime performance. That story's up next. This is Bloomberg. We still see inflation moderating in the next year. It is very unlikely that, it, that we will raise interest rates in the year 2022. That still stands. I can tell you that there was a unanimous concern around the table of the governing council about uh, inflation numbers. It's a regime uh, change, but as you can see, uh, a lot of it is already uh, there, priced in the markets. The bond market, I think, right now it's unpleasant because the regime has shifted, people getting used to it. You know, not long ago, central bankers were telling us we're not gonna raise rates at all. People are beginning to price in finally, uh, you know, getting out of negative policy rates in, in, in Europe. The reality is we haven't hiked rates and they still need to go. As we've seen in the peripheral bonds in Europe, that can be pretty unpleasant. About two years ago, I sent an email out saying we think 10-year bond is going to go positive. Three of my largest contacts in the industry, they insulted Left. me. So I think at every level, we're in a kind of a new regime, and you can see this. The market is trying to find its way. Well, that was ECB President Christine Lagarde and reactions to her shift in position on inflation. Now, the Super Bowl. The Los Angeles Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals 23-20. Rams wide receiver Cooper Cup was named MVP after landing the winning touchdown. But the big stars off the field this year have been ads featuring crypto exchanges and other financial services companies. This ad by FTX Trading, for instance, featured comedian Larry David. Well, joining us now for more on all of this is our Bloomberg Quick Take correspondent, Alex Webb. Alex, I have to say it was really the halftime show that took it for me. Eminem, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg and Mary J. Blige. But what is amazing is the numbers going through in terms of advertising. Why is it still such a big deal? It's it's like the temple of advertising worldwide. It, it, well, this year, for one, there's going to be a sort of record growing audience, which is not something we've seen in quite some time. But even when audiences were declining, the value of ads at the Super Bowl also increased. And that's yeah. partly because you are not getting the same audiences to live TV during the week. You don't have 25 million people watching Friends of a Thursday. Instead, you get a few tentpole big sporting events so that even if the smaller audience is there, they're more passionate, more likely to stick yeah. around, and they therefore bring value in terms of uh, for the advertising. So what about crypto exchanges? Is this desperation trying to become more mainstream, or does this make them more mainstream? It's about making them mainstream. Firstly, there are a couple of different ones competing for market share. We don't quite have a dominant one yet. There are some obviously big ones out there, but they're fighting to be the dominant position. When and that happens, when you know, when mobile when mobile phones were new, or mobile phone companies were new in the 90s, they were all piling into sports advertising. At the moment, you're seeing a similar thing with crypto, but they're also trying to broaden the investor base. You know, they need the new wave of investors to keep prices going up, and so that's why you, you attack this massive or attack, you know, address this massive audience to try to get them into crypto investing. Alex, thank you. So much. Alex Webb there looking at the advertising surrounding the Super Bowl. Now, this is what the markets are doing. A lot of pressure because of Ukraine. Our Anna Edwards will be going through the big moves with Matt Miller and Kate Lines. This is Bloomberg. The Fed clearly needs to start hiking rates um, and uh, probably not shock therapy, uh, definitely not shock therapy. Higher prices um, causing inflation. It's not in the interest of consumers, but not in the interest of producers either. I feel that our job is to make sure that the energy is there as best as possible, as much of it as possible. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. On this Monday, February 14th, our top stories today. 
Tensions build. The U.S.-Russia standoff over Ukraine has entered a potentially decisive week. The U.S. warns an invasion may be imminent. The geopolitical risks ripple through global markets. European stocks and U.S. futures fall as oil reverses earlier gains. And crypto makes its Super Bowl debut. Coinbase may have scored big in Sunday's ad blitz. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everyone. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines, both in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. And Kaylee, I have no doubt that some folks watching this program probably have yet to sleep since the Rams <laughs> clinched the victory yesterday, but they better be awake, shaping up to be a rough day in markets. Yeah, congratulations to anyone who made it through the whole Super Bowl and also is up at this hour. <laughs> I only made it through the half halftime show, which was amazing, by the way. Now, overnight, there was a lot to pay attention to in Asia, broadly a down day for stocks. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole was off by about 1.4%. All the major regional benchmarks lower. A big underperformer was Japan. The Nikkei uh, 225 down two and a quarter percent actually saw its volatility jumping to the highest since back in December. Really stocks in Japan and in the Asia we region more broadly playing catch up to the big losses we saw in the U.S. on Friday. Of course, we have geopolitics with Russia and Ukraine, <clears throat> inflation and the reaction from central banks really front and center in terms of what the market is worried about. While Japanese stocks were lower, though, you did see a bid coming into the safe haven Japanese yen, a big outperformer in Asia. Angie 10FX stronger against the dollar by uh, more than a third of a percent. 115.03 is where we sit. And you also saw that safe haven bid coming into the bond market in Australia. The 10 year yield down seven basis points to 2.138, uh, Matt. So you're seeing a bid into bonds, but of course what we saw in Australia probably playing up to that big bid in treasuries we saw on Friday. Yeah, all right, let's take a look at what we're dealing with this morning here in terms of the U.S. Futures down more than 1%. Remember, we had a 2% drop in the cash trade on Friday. So the geopolitical tensions really ramping up and giving investors jitters. The 10-year yield right now coming down a little bit as investors buy into the perceived safety of government debt. And I've got to look at some safe havens in just a moment. But clearly, the 10-year yield is one of those places that investors go to hide. NYMEX crude coming down. Can't hold on to the highs, but we're still at 92.85 a barrel, 94 for Brent crude. So we're still up there, but we're coming off a little bit. Bitcoin coming off a little at $41,968 as well, even after all of those crypto commercials at the Super Bowl yesterday. Now check out the traditional safe havens. The dollar is clearly one, and we see a little bit of a bid for uh, the Bloomberg dollar index today. Um, the Swiss franc, which is here, and the Japanese yen, which are here. These are dollars priced in Swiss francs, dollars priced in Japanese yen. So as a result, when the franc rises in strength against the dollar or the yen rises in strength against the dollar, you'll see red arrows here coming down. So right now, a U.S. dollar can only buy 92 centimes. Uh, right now, a U.S. dollar can only buy 115 yen. That means people are going into those safe haven assets. Gold coming off a little bit, but still relatively unchanged at 1857, 1858. So a pretty high number uh, for gold as uh, compared to what we've seen historically. Danny, what do you see in European markets? More red on the board, Matt. There's not a single European regional benchmark that is pushing positive today. Losses more than 3% in some regions. At first, it did seem like this was a catch-up to the U.S. trade. But as we went from the futures market to the open of cash equity trading in Europe, the losses started to pile, especially those regions exposed to Eastern Europe, exposed to the geopolitical tensions, suggesting that something else is afoot here, that something else being, of course, the risk of geopolitics. Let me show you what Russia stocks are doing down 3.3 percent this morning. Again, this is where all of the tensions are filtering through this market, not just in equities, but in bonds as well. We're getting a bid similar to what we saw on Friday. That session, this move into haven assets, that playing through in bonds. We're looking at the bun yield, point two. It wasn't that long ago we were talking about this turning positive for the first time in quite a bit and celebrating that. But there are places along the German curve that are now falling back negative again because we are buying that. Similarly, we're looking at a UK twos fives curve that has inverted. Now, this 
key is a bull flattening. This is a bid across the yield for UK markets, but a higher bid on the long end of the curve for that perceived safety. So we had seen bear flattening with concerns about central banks. It's different today. And finally, Kaylee, natural gas up 7%. At one point today, it had been up 14%. It's still about 100 euros below where the peak was, but it's clear with Russia having most of the natural gas, with a lot of that, about a third of it flowing through Ukraine, this is a place where we're seeing those geopolitical tensions also play out this morning. Yeah, we will be paying attention to the entire commodity complex throughout the day and probably throughout the coming days, Danny. Now, what else are we paying attention to in the coming days? A look at what is ahead this week. Later on today, ECB President Christine Lagarde is due to address the European Parliament on the central bank's annual report. Anything she says, I'm sure, will be very closely watched by the market. Then on geopolitics, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz will travel to Ukraine today. Then that will be followed up by Russia tomorrow. We'll also get U.S. retail retail sales and the Fed minutes on Wednesday and then G20 finance ministers and central bankers will meet in Jakarta on Thursday and Friday and finally we'll get a host of Fed officials speaking throughout the week those will include Bullard, Mester, Evans and Brainerd it'll be interesting to see how they react to the really hot inflation data we got last week Matt. yeah absolutely and being driven higher obviously with energy prices as tensions over Ukraine are at a fever pitch a Saturday phone call between presidents Biden and Putin failed to move the needle yesterday the U.S. National Security um, Advisor Jake Sullivan warned about the rising risk that Russia will attack or seek to ignite conflict within Ukraine this week. The way they have built up their forces, the way they have maneuvered things in place, makes it a distinct possibility that there will be major military action very soon. Now, Russia has repeatedly denied that it plans to invade Ukraine. That's important to point out. Joining us now is uh, Anne-Marie Hordern out of D.C., Bloomberg's Washington correspondent. With us in Brussels is our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Anne-Marie, let's start with the latest developments out of Washington. What do we know? Well, the high-stakes phone call on Saturday was really where all the focus was. This was between President Biden and President Putin. And it just yielded no results. There was zero breakthrough, and it was very inconclusive. When you were on the press calls, both in Washington and Moscow, following that report, both sides really stuck to their main talking points. The United States saying, and indeed, an attack could potentially happen at any time, and there would be swift and severe economic consequences. And then in Moscow, the press call was really about how the, Putin was saying that the U.S., quote, hysteria over Ukraine had reached a peak. There's one headline, though, that stood out for me from both capitals, and that is the fact that President Biden and President Putin both agreed that their teams would stay in touch and engaged. And in terms of the, the deterrence here, the president has repeatedly warned of these, you know, repercussions for Russia. Do we actually have a consensus on what potential sanctions would look like, given some of the conflicting concerns from U.S. allies? Well, each country would go about the sanctions package on their own, but there is this unified front, and you can hear that across really the capitals in Europe. Schultz was just tweeting about it as his, he's making his way to Kiev and then to Moscow, that they would be united in severe economic sa sanctions following that. The U.S. has been working for weeks to make sure they could shore up their allies, even some that are very heavily dependent on Russia, that they would form in line. What you're seeing now, though, in the United States, of course, is the fact that in Congress, that harsh economic san sanctions package has yet to cross the finish line. Republicans and Democrats are still debating how much they should put on Russia in terms of penalties immediately and how much should be actually pure deterrence factors. Amory, thanks so much. That's Bloomberg's Amory Hoarder and giving us the view from Washington. Now let's get to the view from Europe. Maria today again joins us in Brussels. So Maria, we have German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Ukraine today, Moscow tomorrow. Given the inconclusivity that we heard from Washington that Anne Marie was describing, what can be accomplished with Scholz visits? Well, Danny, this is a huge test for Olaf Scholz. This is a first-time chancellor who is coming from the SPD, the Social Democrats. They have been hugely under fire for their, at times, confusing relationships with Russia and the Russian political elite. And he will have to send a clear message to Vladimir Putin tomorrow that Germany, this time around, or this time around, means business. Now, there's two things, of course, that will be top of the agenda. One is just how much economic pain Germany is willing to withstand to send along with this political message and then tomorrow of course this is the first time the two will meet 
face to face. This is a very different scenario to Angela Merkel, who was a fluent Russian speaker, and he will have to tell Vladimir Putin to his face whether or not the Nord Stream 2 pipeline gets canceled. Until now, there has been a lot of ambiguity in terms of what happens to that pipeline, and there is growing pressure, not just in Germany, but also in the European Union, that this time Germany really has to send a very, very clear signal. We're talking about potentially a war breaking out an hour away from Berlin. Yeah, and of course, not only would Nord Stream 2 be canceled, but um, the pipeline that runs through Ukraine, which delivers over a third of European energy needs, would likely um, have difficulty uh, maintaining operations. So what does this mean for Europe in terms of getting its energy? Well, Matt, is a very good point because we're talking about Nord Stream 2, but we also have to talk about Nord Stream 1, which is operational. And then, of course, you have to talk about the situation through Ukraine. Ukraine does not use Russian gas, but it is a huge transit nation. And remember, by the way, last year when President Biden and Angela Merkel had a meeting over the summer, she agreed that Germany would continue to pay Ukraine so it wouldn't suffer financially from Nord Stream 2. So, again, you could see supply becoming tighter even more so. But also, Matt, when you look at this, you do see that every scenario on the table for the German government is just so bad. If they cancel the thing, they could face litigation. This is already done. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they still have to pay Ukraine and be still reliant and dependent on Vladimir Putin. So it's not an easy answer for all of Schultz here. It's a very difficult situation for them. Yeah, potentially a lose-lose situation. Bloomberg's Maria today out in Brussels. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, oil is fluctuating amid concerns Russian energy supply might be disrupted. Kriti Gupta, Bloomberg Markets correspondent, joins us now. So Kriti, rough Roughly flat at the moment, but still a 94 handle on Brent. Could $100 oil become a reality due to these tensions? Yeah, it absolutely could. And you're already seeing it kind of play out earlier in the session. You saw Brent crude hit that $96 a barrel uh, peak target. And what's interesting here is that it's not just the geopolitical tensions that are at play. Yes, of course, we know that Russia and Ukraine uh, and, and the Western allies are, of course, at odds. And that is creating this kind of geopolitical premium baked into prices. But remember, Russia is also behind when it comes to supplying. Uh, oil supply simply as part of its OPEC plus target. So it's simply because of a lack of investment that they did last summer and then the weather really prohibiting them from being able to ramp up supply in the way that perhaps Saudi Arabia or the UAE has. So it absolutely is hitting those levels. That being said, you are, are also seeing volatility on the other side as well. So you can actually note that Brent crude is back down to a 94 handle now. And the reason for that is because crude is also a risk asset. So when you see these oil prices kind of fluctuate, you're seeing essentially a tug of war on the one hand. And you have these geopolitical tensions specifically driven by Russia supply and what sanctions might mean for simply the pricing that does happen in dollars. But the other side of the equation is simply that oil does actually move with stocks. It moves with risk assets. It, ha it is kind of this proxy for global growth. And right now, uh, you do have this kind of risk-off sentiment throughout the day in stocks, in Bitcoin, in mm. uh, currencies as well. And well, that, of course, is pulling oil lower as well. And, and, and oil at these levels, of course, is difficult for the Fed because this just aggravates the inflation they're already dealing with Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia yesterday said the Federal Reserve needs to stop pussyfooting around his words. He said they need to tackle inflation head yeah. on again. That's his uh, phrase. He really wants the Fed to come out and do something and he's not alone. Yeah, he's not alone. What's interesting here is that the Fed is really kind of stuck in the between a rock and a hard place. And the best example is treasuries right now, because at the end of the day, it remains a safe haven asset. It remains that geopolitical risk where you start to see funds flowing into the U.S. Treasury market on any headline the U.S. yield will go down even in the face of a hawkish Fed. So right now the Fed and when it comes to the bond market, you really are once again seeing that tug of war. Do you trade that geopolitical risk in the short term or short, short term, excuse me, or do you trade that longer term kind of hawkish pivot? And that's really where people are comparing this to Greenspan's policies going back uh, to 1994. The idea that this is such a uh, aggressive tightening has to take place. You did see the bond market, those 10 year yields rise, I think about 286 basis points between 1993 and 1995, mm. early 1995. And we are already seeing a much bigger reversal uh, this time around. The question is, how does that geopolitical pricing uh, play into that? All right, Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. Now, Matt and Danny, we've talked about the markets. We've talked about geopolitics. We also have to talk about that little game that happened yesterday. Uh, I think I'm the only one that watched it because it was past most of our bedtimes. I have to say it was a really good first half. Didn't catch the second half, but the Rams 23 to 20, topping Joe Burrow and the Bengals. Cooper Cup with the game winning touchdown, getting that MVP. Uh, and of course, the commercials, also something we were paying attention to, Matt. Yeah, the, I, 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 I would love to watch the game um, we'll probably do later this afternoon. 
Uh, obviously, I had to go to bed, but I did watch some of the commercials. I especially love Larry David doing the <laughs> FTX crypto commercial, but crypto <laughs> was huge, right? It was huge. You know what else was huge? This is why the American consumer sentiment surveys have fallen so much. Beer was $17 a pop. <laughs> Kaylee, that is some painful inflation to face at the Super Bowl. Yeah. Well, if you're lucky enough you're to get there. a ticket to the Super Bowl, yeah. I think it's <laughs> yeah, probably true. fine. Now, what's it. interesting is, of course, you would expect that some uh, betting stocks would be doing well. They were doing really well last week leading up to the game, but that is not the case, actually, when you look at pre-market trading. DraftKings, one of the big ones, of course, is actually moving lower. It's down by about 2%, so giving back some of those gains, but, of course, it is a broad risk-off day. There's only a handful of stocks actually in positive territory in early hours this morning. One uh, that is in positive territory though is Splunk. This is after the weekend uh, was reported that Cisco Sim Systems was potentially looking at a $20 billion takeover of the company. Those talks apparently failed, so that deal is not happening. Still though, that stock is up about 3% in early hours. And finally, Lockheed Martin is also a little bit higher. Uh, one of its deals had faced a pushback from the FTC because it may hurt competition within the aerospace space. So it's not having to pay $4.4 billion for that company. So it's up about half a percent in early hours, Danny. Kaylee, I fear that some of this negativity in markets has to do that we all wore shades of red for Valentine's Day today. <laughs> I fear that we might have cursed it a little bit. All right, well, on a more serious note, coming up, we're going to be speaking to Ed Clissold, Ned Davis, chief U.S. strategist, about the red we're seeing throughout markets. How do you position as geopolitics fears filter through and oil growing increasingly volatile amid tensions in Ukraine? More on the energy story ahead, plus the real winner of the Super Bowl. We're going to discuss the ads that scored big. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Danny Berger filling in for Anna Edwards over in London. Now, we are watching energy very closely as the uh, Russia-Ukraine tensions continue to heat up. I've got a chart here that shows Brent's dated to frontline swaps. Now, this is the difference between um, the nearest futures contract and the price of an actual barrel of oil, and it has surged to a record high right now, showing that um, buyers are finding it difficult to get hold of the physical commodity. Joining us now is Will Kennedy, Bloomberg Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities out of London. Will, what's going on here? I mean, it's not just um, the, the geopolitical tensions, but there seems to be a supply problem. Um, the market is extremely tight, and the chart that you're showing there, Matt, is telling us that the market is extremely tight. Traders want oil and they want oil in the short term and they're willing to pay a premium to get it, um, as, you, uh, as you point out there. So what we have right now is a mixture of uh, very strong supply-demand fundamentals. Demand is recovering very strongly. Supply um, is probably lagging to some extent. We've talked extensively about how OPEC plus production isn't meeting its commitments. Stockpiles around the world are declining. And on top of that, you're layering this extreme geopolitical tension uh, involving the world's second largest oil export of Russia. And it's a pretty bullish mix. Super backwardation, not going anywhere. Will, thank you so much for the update. That's Bloomberg's Will Kennedy on all things oil. Speaking of which, later today, we're going to be speaking with Citigroup Global Head of Commodities Research, Ed Morris. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. More on these markets next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. Here's what you need to know. President Joe Biden told Ukraine's leader on Sunday that the U.S. and its allies would act swiftly and decisively if Russia were to invade Ukraine, echoing comments he made on a Saturday call with Russia's Vladimir Putin. The U.S. says an invasion may be imminent, while Russia has repeatedly said it has no plans to invade. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is set to meet with Putin in Moscow today. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly is calling for the rate hike path to be data dependent and measure. Daly told CBS that abrupt and aggressive action can be destabilizing. Meanwhile, U.S. Senator Joe Manchin told the Fed it needs to, quote, stop pussyfooting around and tackle inflation head on. And the Los Angeles Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals 23-20 to to win the Super Bowl on Sunday. The victory gives the Rams their second-ever Super Bowl title and their first as a team based in Los Angeles. Crypto also made its Super Bowl debut. Coinbase may be the biggest winner in Sunday's ad blitz. I'm Danny Berger in London, filling in for Anna Edwards with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, yes, we're all just shaking off the Super Bowl hangover this morning, but it is turning out to be quite an ugly day when it comes to this trading session. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I obviously didn't stay up to watch the Super Bowl, um, but I did watch futures this morning starting around 3 o'clock. We're down significantly right now, 8 tenths, 9 tenths of a percent. After the big drop that we saw on uh, on Friday, we were down almost 2 percent on Friday. So we're off more than 7 percent year to date for the benchmark index, and it looks like it's going to fall further on geopolitical tensions today. One of the places investors are hiding is um, it bonds. We see the 10-year yield now coming down. It's still at a relatively high level, 191.29, um, but it's off as investors seek safety there. NYMEX crude now turning higher. It had been off a little bit this morning, um, going back up, and you can see $93.22 a barrel. That's not Brent. That's WTI. So it's a pretty high quote here. Bitcoin off just a little bit, even after all those crypto commercials, 42,146. I've got to be honest. I woke up this morning, Kaylee, and I thought Bitcoin would be up because of so much hype yesterday. Right. I thought there'd be a lot of retail buying, but it doesn't look like that's the case. Yeah, I thought so too, Matt. Coinbase, for example, which had the commercial that was one of the most buzziest with that QR code that was just bouncing around the screen. I, a journalist who was naturally curious, did scan it to see what it was. And it was for Coinbase, but Coinbase actually isn't trading in pre-market. A lot of other stocks are, though, and almost all of them are to the downside. Among companies worth $5 billion or more, only 12 of them are higher in early hours. For $25 billion or more, only four of those companies are in the green. A lot of others in the red, and it really is across sectors. Vaccine Makers like Novavax down 2%. You also have a lot of the travel complex under pressure. Carnival's down about 2.3%. Some of those more lofty values uh, like Tesla are also lower. And then even oil, we were talking about that story. Oil has been bouncing around. Even ExxonMobil is down about 9 tenths of 1%. So a broad, broad risk off day uh, here in the U.S. when it comes to individual names, Danny. The losses in Europe, Kaylee, are more steep than that. And that just does show you the geopolitical tension, where it's getting priced in and how it's being felt most acutely. The DAX, for example, down more than 3%. We can see Russia stocks down more than 3% as well. So anything with the Eastern Europe type exposure taking a hit today, much like you were pointing at, Matt, throughout Europe, we're getting buying into that perceived safety of bonds. We're looking at a 10-year German bond yield that's down eight basis points. We're on track for the big decline in the 10-year bond yield since the start of the pandemic. So again, it's that bid into safety, of course, this time for a much different reason. You're also seeing it in the United Kingdom, where the fives, sevens curve has, inver or rather the twos, fives curve have inverted. Now, it's not because of BOE bond buying. It is a bull flattening. In other words, everybody is buying bonds across the board. They're just doing so more acutely in the long end of the curve. So that is causing this to invert, going negative and finally, natural gas down 4.5%. Russia, of course, supplies most of the nat gas. A third of it flows through Ukraine. So naturally, su concerns about supply sending that higher, Kaylee. All right, Danny. Well, let's talk more about these markets. Ed Klissel, chief U.S. strategist for Ned Davis Research Group, is joining us now. Ed, of course, one thing that is really in focus today is geopolitical risk. And I want to point to the research just out of Morgan Stanley. Mike Wilson and the team writing that a war materially increases the odds of uh, a polar vortex, he calls it, for the economy and earnings. A spike in energy prices would destroy demand and, in our view, in our view, and perhaps tip several economies into outright recession. 
I'm wondering how you view these geopolitical risks, Ed, and whether or not that could potentially become a reality. Well, yeah, I think there's two things to, to consider when you're talking about these geopolitical risks. The first is the sentiment reaction. And you know, we, we've done studies going back several decades looking at these, uh, at these crisis events. And usually the market uh, reacts negatively first, down um, about 3% during the crisis itself for the S&P 500. But then you recover that over the next one to three months. Um, usually, the market, you know, doesn't like the uncertainty, and once that's uh, the bad news is is out there, then the market can can move forward. But the other aspect is where we are in the cycle, with the Fed um, obviously starting to uh, tighten, most likely in March, and they're ratcheting up how many hikes they're going to do this year. And then the earnings cycle is also at a phase that's less favorable for the market, where um, you know, earnings is going to earnings are going to decelerate from about 65 percent growth um, in 2021 to right now consensus is around 8 percent for 2022. We're taking the under on that earnings mm. um, on that earnings growth um, because margins are already very high, and then you throw on some 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 higher um, uh, costs in there, margins will get hit even more. So uh, so that is certainly a risk for the market. So, on, I mean, 8% wouldn't be bad, but less would, I think, disappoint the market. Do you agree that um, the inflation is, inflation is really the problem for corporate earnings this year? Well, yeah, so if you take a, a, a historical view of it, in the third year of an expansion, usually margins are continuing to rise. But because companies did such a great job so far this cycle, um, margins have already recovered uh, to previous highs and well past them. So it's going to be hard for them to continue to, to get margin improvement. Uh, and, and then you throw on um, some higher costs, not only from, from uh, energy prices, but of course, wages, which are the, the biggest input for most companies. And um, we don't think margins are going to get crushed. It only happens during recessions. But, uh, but a, a little bit of downward margin pressure um, on, on the back of already decelerating earnings could, could it get as close to, to zero earnings growth for the year. And that, I think, would be a pretty big surprise for the market. But you're, to be clear, Ed, you're not bearish um, 2022, right? I mean, you are neutral this year. What does that mean for your strategy? Where do you uh, put your money if you have dry powder? Yeah, so we're for an absolute basis for the S&P 500. That's neutral. Neutral means you know five to seven percent return for the year. Um, our our thought coming into the year was to be a weak first half, maybe a little bit better second half. That's how it's setting up as of right now. But from an allocation standpoint, we ratcheted down our equity allocation, or we still are modestly overweight. Um, 55 percent is our benchmark for stocks. We're at 60, um, and we've gone up in in cash and we're underweight bonds. Now, usually the way these um, these corrections take place is, um, it, first of all, the bonds get hit on inflation concerns, but then, uh, then it will become more risk off. So if we were to make additional moves out of stocks, it might actually be more into bonds and less in, into cash yeah. because it can become more of a true risk off move. That's not what we've done up to this point. Though. Ed, how nimble do investors need to be in this volatile period and have cash at the ready to deploy should there be opportunities? Yeah, cash really really is something that most investors have tried to shun because it was yielding basically nothing on a real real basis negative. Um, but now is the time to have some in your portfolio, some, some dry powder, because um, double dip recessions or recessions within a few years of each other are very rare in the U.S. Only one in the last 70 years. That was 80, 82. Um, so if it's not a recession, the, the decline in the market tends to be limited around seven months. About 20 percent um, is the average. So that, you know, don't you know, write that in stone. That's the average. But that would mean that, that have some to have some dry powder to deployed maybe around around mid year when some of these concerns are lifted. You know, and if the market is down. Um, quite a bit, then I would expect the Fed would at, at least mm. start to ratchet back on their rate hikes, and that could uh, provide some relief for the market as well. Okay, so maybe somewhat of a Fed put would kick in, Ed. On the subject of the Fed, a headline just crossing from the Wall Street Journal that Esther George, the Kansas City Fed president, said they may need to actually start selling bonds from that $9 trillion balance sheet in order to curb inflation. So not just letting them run off, but actual outright asset sales. I'm wondering how you view the Fed's different policy tools, not just the hiking mechanism, but also running off and potentially starting to sell assets off that balance sheet and what the influence would be on this market. 
Yeah, if, if if the Fed were to ask me what to do, I would say I'd focus a little bit more on QT and less on rate hikes to avoid flattening the curve. Um, and and you could do that, you know, using their, their mortgage-backed securities, um, um, which, you know, we have to wonder with the housing market as hot as, as it is, why are they still buying mortgage-backed securities? So, uh, so that would be one, one way to go and would be... Um, Probably something that the market would react a little bit more favorably to uh, than maybe you know hi hiking uh, every single meeting or throwing in some 50 basis point hikes, which has been floated out there. Ed, thank you so much. Great to get your insight today. Good luck on today's markets with this volatile day that's shaping up to be. Ed Klissel, Chief U.S. Strategist for Ned Davis Research Group. Now coming up, Sunday night's big winner. More on crypto's ad blitz next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Accenture CEO Julie Sweet. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance simulcast on radio and television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York, Danny Berger in London. Now, crypto made its big debut yesterday during the Super Bowl, with advertising spots being bought by the likes of FTX and Crypto.com. The big winner of the evening may have been Coinbase. The 60-second promo seen here featured a bouncing QR code that directed viewers to the company's website. The ad was so popular it crashed Coinbase's uh, website. So I guess a lot of people actually did. Um, if you could figure out how to do it, take a picture, I guess, of the QR code and then, or do you have to have a <laughs> QR reader? I don't know, I'm too old. Joining us now is Paul Sweeney. He co hosts Bloomberg Markets with me on the radio, and he also helped create our investment research practice, Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Paul, of course, you have years of experience on Wall Street as well, covering the media. What did you think about, I mean, yesterday was big, not only because it was a Super Bowl, and there were teams that aren't yep. normally in the Super Bowl, and betting is legal, and crypto <laughs> is buying ads. What were your thoughts? It was a heck of a day for NBC, for Comcast that owns NBC. I mean, they started the day uh, at noon East Coast time. The game didn't begin till 6.30, so they had all that time and all that programming. And so it was a great game which is, you know, first and foremost. And so if you bought an ad in the first quarter, you were happy. If you bought an ad in the fourth quarter, you were happy because it was a competitive game, and that's really what you're looking for. I saw that some spots cost $7 million for 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, I guess if you have it, you might as well spend it. But uh, is it placement? Is it you want to be around the halftime show? Do you want to be around the fourth quarter or the first quarter since a lot of us, you know, uh, only watched the very beginning and then went to bed. Right. <laughs> no, so, yeah, exactly. So, you know, the first quarter, the beginning of the game is certainly some of the prime real estate. Uh, then the real estate around the halftime show, for a lot of people, they don't necessarily watch the game. They watch the halftime show. And, of course, it was a huge halftime show for uh, NBC. So if you had ad placements around that, that was great. Uh, but what was great for NBC and, and, and for the game in particular was that it was a competitive game right down to the last uh, seconds of the game. And that's really what you want if you're an advertiser, if you're a fan. Yeah, game was great. Halftime show, have Snoop. to say, was great. <laughs> Snoop, Mary J. Blige, 50 Cent, Upside Down. Eminem yep. was there as well. When you talk about viewership, though, and why advertisers would pay this much for 30 seconds, has it been going on the up? Because I thought none of us really watched TV anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think what we found in the, in the world of cord cutting mm. and more and more of us watching streaming, um, that's an issue for all advertisers, for all programmers. But one thing that has really stayed really constant is sports. And sports are really key for advertising and really key for audience. And nothing's bigger than the, the Super Bowl. So every single year, the Super Bowl is huge. And that's where yeah. advertisers want to be, even the Olympics. So NBC has the Super right. Bowl, but also the Olympics. So it's just been extraordinary. Been watching, it, yeah. right. He's been watching every day. Yeah. yeah, it's been a big couple weeks for NBC. I myself only really watch the figure skating. I'm more of a summer Olympics kind of gal. <laughs> People aren't just watching, though. They are also increasingly betting on these games and not just, you know, the outcome or the final score, but little individual things like who is going to complete the most passes. 
how do you view the NFL's embrace of online gambling at this point? I tell you, just as recently as two or three years ago, the, uh, the NFL was completely against right. betting in any shape or form. But since it's been uh, legalized in about 30 states and, in, and more coming, uh, they've really embraced it. So it's uh, betting's become a real big part of sports in general including the NFL and including the Super Bowl. So you see ads across the NFL broadcast for these betting sites across the board. So it has become a real big part of the sport. Hey, Paul, Danny here in London as well. Thrilled to have this conversation because where I am, most people have a, a very wrong idea of what football is. But I wonder if you look at <laughs> I wonder if you look at all these crypto ads we saw during the Super Bowl. If any sort of memory comes to mind to you, specifically 2000s and when we had sock puppets for pets.com. Right. Is it a warning sign? You know, I, it, it's interesting. I mean, I think I, I was right there in, in the 2000s uh, on Wall Street selling these dot com stocks. So, but I think the issue here for crypto is it, it is an asset class, and I think um, most investors feel like they're not really sure about crypto right now. Uh, but I think uh, even Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan is not really sure about crypto hmm. right now. But I mean, it is clearly, uh, I think, an well, asset sure. class here, and I think most investors are, are embracing it whether it's the retail investor or institu institutional investors as well. I thought about Jamie Dimon when I was watching this Larry David commercial. Exactly. Because <laughs> Dimon is sure. He says it's worthless, right. you know, which yeah. is kind of like what David was saying about the light bulb when he was uh, talking to Edison right. or whoever that is there. Um, on the other hand, a huge amount of money are in this asset class. So, you know, whether you're against it or not, you, you might as well be for trading it, right? And that's who was uh, putting all these ads up. The Coinbase one was weird. Did you did you scan the QR code? I, I mean, did not the, scan the, the kids, I did. The kids loved it, Killed but I kids. didn't. I was kind of <laughs> lying back on the couch with maybe a cold adult beverage in my hand, and I didn't necessarily have the wherewithal to scan it. But at the end of the ad, I finally got it. Oh, yeah, I think I'm supposed to scan something here. <laughs> so I thought it was a very cool ad. It def I looked at, uh, you know, I just said, hey, this is going to be talked about tomorrow yes. and that's all you want if you're buying a, 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 you know, a Super Bowl ad to be talked about the next day maybe the next week the next month or even in the moment I was looking at my Twitter feed after that ad and there were people who absolutely hated it thought it was the dumbest ad ever and people who said hey this is brilliant but everyone was, talking was about tweeting it. about it and I think that's at the right. end of the day that's the goal Bloomberg's Paul Sweeney thank you so much Danny I scanned the QR code I'm just gonna say <laughs> that I'm a journalist I'm curious I needed to know what it was about I couldn't bring myself to do it because I felt the frustration of the Windows screensaver of that little QR code <laughs> not getting Awful. into the corner. I, I couldn't. Awful. Oh, so frustrating. And in like so frustrating. Eight bit as well. It was bad. <laughs> mm. For that reason alone, I would not grant it with a scan. <laughs> All right, <laughs> coming up, we're going to be speaking more about crypto with Jesse Powell, CEO of Digital Currency Exchange and trading platform Payward Inc. That's at 5.30 p.m. in New York, 10.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger is in London. And also joining us now, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, what I really want to talk to you about is Super Bowl and all the great ads that were out there. But unfortunately, yeah. it is actually also a big market day. Commodities in focus, stocks taking a leg lower. Well, of course, all off of Ukraine and the news flow that we'll see from Moscow, from Kiev, and from Washington and points in Europe as well. The litmus paper here is oil. Let's look at a chart that goes way, way back off the Bloomberg. This is an approximation of inflation-adjusted oil using long-term charts back to the 50s. This is Saudi light and an inflation series from the United States. So I'm going to call it an approximation off of the Nixon break in oil, then up we go, two rounds of OPEC, the collapse in 1986, a little spike in the middle of the chart as Persian Gulf won, and up we go to $96 a barrel right now. Where is oil, Kaylee, when we say $100 a barrel? The average price in today's dollars is about $118 a barrel. That's a pretty good approximation of the pain that we had 
a number of years ago. It's interesting that you bring up the Nixon break because I uh, equate <coughs> that with a shift from big block, big inch muscle cars to, you know, tiny little, that's when the Ford Mustang went oh, yeah, from absolutely. something glorious oh, to yeah. something laughable. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And maybe that's what we want right now, you know? Maybe that will drive consumers to EV demand because I've been hearing a lot about demand <clears throat> destruction at these price levels. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a topic, Matt, that we could spend an entire show on. And I will tell you, living it, that there were seismic shifts driven by consumers in OPEC, what I call OPEC 1 and OPEC 2. And the parody of it is a VW rabbit, which John Farrow thinks is a golf. <laughs> but, but you're right. It was a tumultuous time for engineering as we confronted the new price of oil. I don't see that right now, hmm. but it's definitely worth a study. All right, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. And of course, we have to pay attention to a number of things today. I am watching Ukraine tensions, really one of the reasons why we are watching oil in particular. It seems that there wasn't any real progress over the weekend. President Biden talked to Vladimir Putin, seemed kind of inconclusive. He also talked to Vladimir Zelensky, just reiterated things that he's already said. So my question really is, when Olaf Scholz heads to Ukraine today and Moscow tomorrow, can the German leader make any more progress? Progress, especially because he's been caught in a very tough position, hasn't taken the firmest stance on uh, this particular issue, Matt. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the coming days. Yeah, we'll be paying very close attention, and I'm watching commodities for that very same reason. Um, but it's not all about oil. You know, Javier Blas, our brilliant energy uh, investigative reporter who wrote The World for Sale, the uh, book The World for Sale, has an opinion piece on the Bloomberg today about how aluminum is where inflation is headed. So um, it's really across the commodity sector. And here you see the BCOM Commodities Index. Danny? Yeah, I'm also watching 13Fs. Hedge funds have to file that. That's, of course, the quarter prior. So a little bit outdated, but should be interested if we see this shift from value. Uh, away from growth. Now we have more Bloomberg surveillance ahead of you. We're going to hear from JP Morgan, among others. This is Bloomberg.